beautiful, isn't it? Today, we'll be going to the distant past, when beasts like this one and Led Zeppelin roamed freely around the planet, when I was able to get a gig and a young man on the western side of a large country called the United States of America. Shall I tell you? Uh, America. Uh, his name, well, let's call him Mr. Smith, shall we? Anyway, Mr. Smith created this once noble amplifier brand, and it was praised by everybody around the world. But sadly, one night around midnight, Mr. Smith went to the crossroads trying to flag a ride, and he was given a lift by a person who drove Mr. Smith into the darkness. <sighs> sadly, this name has now been associated with that dark period. And every tech in the world now hates, loathes and despises working on this once noble brand. All, uh, it's all except for one. Um, all technicians except for, okay, and you. All technicians except for two hate and loathe working on this brand. If you want to find out why, as we breathe the life back into this beauty, go grab yourself a caffeinated beverage and bring one back for me as well. And I'll see you very shortly. Small cup, 30 mils of espresso, milk beautifully steamed, of course, in a Daphne blue cup. Mm. I have to say, this Mark I boogie is an absolute beauty to behold. I love that basket weave front. And look at this timber. It looks like mahogany to me, but I'm no carpenter, but it looks like mahogany. And look at this beautiful finger jointing here. Just gorgeous. Beautiful work. But sadly, <laughs> I have a feeling this ends on the outside. I think we've got another treat in store in this. I'm not sure if you can see that, but can you see that hint of an aluminium dome there? I'm thinking we've got perhaps a JBL, perhaps an Altec, something special in there. Let's have a look. Okay, that's good news. We've got two 6L6 power tubes here, so it's a 60 watt, 50, 60 watt amp instead of a totally outdated 100 watt version and with such a beautiful finish to the cabinetry this sort of stuff just makes me go what the hell were they thinking just um uh, whatever this stuff's called i can't remember now it's been so long since i've seen it aha uh -huh. and there's that speaker oh that's going to be nice an altec speaker beautiful as much as i dislike Miss a boogie, I must say they do some things very, very well. And these massive blocks of iron, man, they weigh a lot. But Mr. Smith knows that you cannot scrimp on transformers if you're looking for the ultimate in tone. So to that, I salute you. Okay, I'm seeing here the fuse is marked as 2.5 amp. I'm going to look at the schematic. Schematic. It's saying 2.5 amp uh, for a 60 watt. Correct. However, this is in America. We're at 240 here. So instead of uh, 2.5 amp, we should be seeing a 1.25 here. And let's see. That is so. No. Someone's put in a fast blow to amp. We wanted 1.25. 
half of that as a slow blow. So I've now got a 1.2 slow blow in there. So that should be the right one. Now let's have a look. What have we got here? We've got um, Power Transformer here, 606, which is Schumacher, 26th week of 1976. That one is the Output Transformer is also a, uh, is it? Yeah, it is. Schumacher, 75. Now, this is our reverb driver, also 1965. And this, because it's only got two wires, one in, one out, is a choke. And that is 75. So we're going to call this amp a 76. And I, I very much doubt that the factory would have put this horrible graffiti on here. I do appreciate the fact that um, they've put the labelling on here for the reverb tank, but it just looks a bit tacky. So uh, I'm now going to clean this up so it doesn't look quite so graffiti bound. And that RCA socket there is black. Opposite side is grey, so we'll just mark those for future texts. And me, I did manage to remove the um, the uh, black and the uh, grey writing, and I just replaced it with a bit of black nail polish and red nail polish. Um, one of the le reverb leads was black, and the other one was grey, so I just put a dab of red on the grey. So, what have we got here? We got some. Sovtech 6L6s, we'll test them, see how they're going. And we've got hmm, an unmarked. Oh, hang on, do I see something there? My little UV torch. Sometimes it reveals things. But in this case, no, this one also has no visible markings. This one should be a 12A T7. May well be the driver for the reverb transformer. We'll check that on the schematic. What are they with this using unidentified tubes? Now, I think I might just start doing some capacitor checks on this. This has got me a bit confused. This is why it's really important that when you put capacitors in, you always have them facing upwards so that the next tech, in this case me, can see what values these are. I know it's 350 volt. This one I've got no idea about. So I'm assuming that these two capacitors here are 60 at 350. Right? These would be the original ones from Mesa installed correctly. We can see what they are and um, we can see that they're head to tail as these are here. These 250 uh, kilo ohm resistors are what I call totem resistors and they're basically to ensure that that voltage is balanced uh, exactly across those two capacitors when the amp is on. And when the amp is turned off, it also gives it a discharge path to ground. So that's those two. Then we've got 330 microfarad capacitors at 500. I'm concerned about this. If this is meant to be one of them, then this is drastically underrated. So let's see if we've got any clues here. So this is a 10K going between that one and that one. And that looks like another 10K going between there and there. So here we got 10K going between two and would be 6.8k. Now I have my ESR meter here and I really like this one because it lets me set the 
frequency. Most of the cheaper ones just default at one kilohertz. Uh, with a filter capacitor, um, as you know, they're, they're going to be working at 100 hertz in Australia, 120 hertz in the USA. So we're going to step that frequency down until we see 100 hertz. That's it there. All right, so we're going to check these ones first. Now, where's the, that's the negative? I don't have a 60 microfarad, so 60 is going to be somewhere between here and here. At 350, I want to be seeing somewhere between 3 and 1 ohm maximum. Let's call it somewhere around 2 ohms maximum. That one, surprisingly, is 0.5. So that's telling me that it's okay. The other one, 65 microfarad and 1.5. Let's check this bias cap. Uh, 70, so we should be seeing something around about 0 0.6, 0 0.5, somewhere around there. That's high, so if we're going to change any, I'll just put a little black dot on the suspect ones. Now we don't know what this is because we can't read it, and to twist it around might compromise it. So it's looking at, looking like it could be 100 microfarad at 350 volts. We'd want to be seeing, you know, at around about one. It's measuring okay, but we're going to see what sort of voltage is actually on that one. Thirty microfarad at five hundred volts. We should be seeing something around two, 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 three, two and a half max. Yeah, it's there at two and a half. Okay, they're both reading okay. All right, now I'm just going to check these dropping resistors. This one should be 10K. Well, that says 10K rather. And that one's 10K as well. Good, they're both looking pretty good. I think um, Randall must have got his granddaughter to draw up this circuit diagram. All right, so I'm going to check this one. Put a little black dot there as well. Man, I've got to say, this is not matchless type of quality. This is really... I mean, what we see here belies the quality of the cabinet. I think whoever did the cabinet is, is great. Whoever did the wiring really should go back to apprentice school. Look at this. This is just disgraceful quality of wiring. I'm really hoping that this was not what was coming out of the factory. This is just dreadful, man. The money they charge. And this is what I'm seeing with these Mesa Boogie. I respect the people, the fact that some people love them and some of my great mates love them. David, I'm talking about you. Oh, hello. I'm not sure if you can see that. This connection here to um, input number one is literally hanging by a thread. And I reckon if I went like that, it'd come off. So my first job is to reconnect that securely. The contacts here look very dirty, but that wouldn't stop it working. 
Look at this. Has someone with terrible soldering skills been in here? I mean, the amp is what, nearly 50 years old, so I'm sure hoping this is not what came out of the factory. Oop. Burned wire. Burned wire. Not sure if you can see that. Burned wire. Bent legs all over the place. I mean, look at the circuit board. Good God, there's just flux everywhere. It just looks terrible. And they charge good money for this. Hello, what's going on here? That is pin three, one, two, three. Pin three, as you know, is the uh, plate. Why is there a 220 kilo ohm resistor coming off that plate, going here to a brown wire, a uh, blue wire, sorry, which then gets wrapped around here and goes nowhere. So sitting at this random point in the air is going to be one hell of a high plate voltage. I don't know. It looks intentional, but I've never seen anything like that. That's a mystery. I'm sure someone watching this knows more about the peculiarities of a Mesa Boogie. So please drop me a comment there. I'd be fascinated to know why there is that resistor hanging off there. I am really tempted to remove this I can see it doing nothing and in actual fact we're putting a very high voltage, probably the other side of 400 volts, just floating there in mid space. And if someone was silly enough to touch that or careless enough to touch it, whew, that would be pretty catastrophic. All right, I've secured this um, shielded cable back to the input jack here. And I've got a sine wave going into that at the moment at 440 hertz, 250 millivolt. I've um, lifted that leg off that plate. I was just a bit nervous about having that high plate voltage floating around. And now we're going to just start ramping it up a little bit on the Variac. And here you're watching the voltage on that reservoir capacitor. So I'm in Australia, so 240 volts is our main supply here. It's 80 we've just gone through. That's interesting. It's showing 176, which is good, right? Because that's going to be roughly half of that. That means there's another capacitor here somewhere that's doing, aha, uh -huh. I see it. So you probably can't see it hidden from view. But there's another capacitor here. And I wouldn't mind betting that that is hooked up to that one. And of course, it's, it's not shown on the schematic. That's a bit of a problem one to get to in terms of measuring its health. But at least I can put my mind at ease and know we're not going to exceed that rating there. I've got a speaker plugged in, by the way. OK, on we go. 200 volts, pilot lights on, 225, 230, 236, 237, 240 volts. Okay, nothing has gone pop. And I'm hearing and 
that sounds like 440 hertz to me. Now, let me just... plug a guitar in. thing's either insanely loud or all of the gain is happening in the first couple of notches. Ooh. Okay, that's the uh, input jack that I resolved the wire on. Oh yeah. Okay, that's definitely sick. All right, so I think my first task is to remove both of these input jacks, see if I can save them by giving them a good clean, tighten up the contacts, or else it'll be replacing them. Now we can just hear a bit of background buzz. Okay, I don't think it's coming from the guitar, uh, from the amp. So I'm gonna put this on full volume. Hmm. Got some didgeridoo stuff happening there. And some high frequency oscillation, which you probably can't pick up on the microphone, but there's definitely some high frequency stuff happening there. All right, let's pop out these input jacks and see if we can clean them up and save them. This socket, also covered in gunge. And then we're just gonna make sure that that earthing leaf there is making good contact with there, so we're going to clean that out as well. Let's see how this fella's going. It's been soaking in there for a couple of minutes. That's looking much better. It's looking a lot better. If you can find them, I like these cotton buds with a timber shaft on it. They're a lot stronger than those other stupid flexible ones, which I guess are meant to not break into your eardrum. That's the level of crap we're talking about in here. Yeah, that contact there is open. I'm not sure if you can see it, but when I pr plug something into it, it closes that contact. So I'm just going to get in there with a little bit of fine wet and dry just to make sure we have good contact. I should do that. This is a good use of that pre-bought contact cleaning file. It's really fine and way stiffer and easier to handle than um, wet and dry sandpaper. All right, contact cleaner. Flush out. Dry. Looks like a brand new one. The only place that the input jacks get their ground reference to the chassis ground is through the actual body of the socket itself. So important that this contact face here be clean. The mating face on the chassis also be cleaned and I've just buffed that up with a little bit of coarser sandpaper. 
but also the washer. I don't know if the camera's going to pick that up, but these washers are really heavily oxidized. So that's not a great uh, contact to ground. So using Dremel brush, Dremel, whatever you call it, Dremel thing, and brush to save my fingers from getting sanded. I'm just going to wire brush this. Might even try it. There it pliers. That's much better. When you're using this with a little wire brush attachment, I could feel the little metal filings coming up and hitting me on the face from the little brush fibers. Always make sure you're wearing safety glasses if you're not bespeckled. Done. So I cleaned up both of those sockets and I reinstalled them. I've got to say, I'm not real happy with the long term prospects of um, the socket on uh, input number one. That's that oddball one, it's called a make contact, not a break contact like the more traditional Switchcraft 12 8 this is a 13 and so it makes a contact when you push the lead in. Not that common, uh, my supplier in Australia doesn't have it, my two suppliers in Australia don't have it, so I've had to import that part in so it'll be a little bit of a while, I think in the meantime it's going to work. If I have a bit of wetness on here, it's because it's March 11, uh, 2023. It's really hot. It's 33 degrees Celsius outside, which is about 90, early 90s, maybe 92 in uh, northern temperatures. Um, and my dog likes to play water games. So we just had a little lunchtime break to go out and play. Let's see if we can chase the water down in the hose. Yeah, well, German Shepherds are smart, but they're not that smart. Anyway, let's see how this worked. I'm really happy with the way that turned out. Oh yeah, that, that volume control doesn't work with input two but it will on this one, so it's a bit noisy. Yeah, see, still got a bit of that noise. I've, I will put in that new jack when it comes in. Can't say I'm thrilled to bits with the sound of it. I mean, it sounds all right. There's obviously many thousands of people who like it. But here's some of the things about it that I don't like. A sovereign the fact that the assembly work is just really untidy for a premium amp. Look at how, let's just pick one for example. Let's pick it, this lead here. It's a shielded cable, nice shielded cable, but it goes underneath this green wire, passes through underneath that resistor, then it goes underneath that resistor, underneath that resistor. <laughs> uh, heaven help us if we wanted to, let, let's say we wanted to replace that resistor, you know, how would you do that? This resistor here is holding it in place. You'd, you'd have to end up melting that shielding. So the only way to replace that resistor or that resistor is to unsolder and remove that cable. And then obviously no intelligent person would, would run it like that again. It's obviously going to the grid and I don't know if you can hear that. Just going near it is enough to send it into oscillation. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can lift this board here without having to unsolder everything. I just want to check the health of this 
capacitor that is in series with this one. Just make sure it's healthy. Then I think I will replace these. They're way past their use by date anyway, so I will. These are 60 microfarad at 350 volts. Um, when you series them, it comes down to 30 microfarad. I don't, honestly don't think that's enough filtering. I've got a choice of uh, F and T 100s, but they are fatter than these, shorter, but fatter. And I don't want to obscure the access to these resistors here, which we checked and, and were fine. I also have these um, newer ones available from um, one of my US suppliers and um, MOD brand. I think they're made in South America, I think. And um, the, rate, uh, the diameter is about the same as that one. So I'm going to use these. I've used these in quite a few repairs. And I've got to say, I have not had any issue with them at all. And they're 105 degrees, which I like. Because temperature is the enemy of um, capacitors. So I'll replace both of these. And I'm going to replace that one too. What's it? A 64. What's our schematic say? Our schematic says 50 at 70. Okay, avert your ears, Mesa Boogie lovers, and avert your eyes, because we're going to have a look at what a disgraceful assembly this uh, underneath side of the capacitor board is. This is a premium product, folks. I just can't understand how they get away with this. Disgraceful. Anyway, um, I lifted the board, so not so I could... Um, take the piss out of Mesa Boogie because they do do some nice stuff um, but I wanted to measure this capacitor and make sure it was still okay both in terms of capacitance and ESR and leakage and um, no sign of any issue there but I am glad I looked at this because I was going to um, just replace these caps which I don't know if you can see but the wire from the cap then goes down here and I know my new lead is not going to be anywhere near that long. So what I'm going to do is um, snip the wires from up here and just connect the new capacitors there. So I've got a couple of new capacitors installed. Well, not installed yet. Just sized up. So I'm going to install them from above because the leads of the original capacitors are forming part of the circuit underneath. So, so I'll just do this from up here. There's no circuit board below that we compromise in the integrity of the joints with the pads. Now I'm going to just apply a bit of my preferred um, adhesive underneath. And um, I like to use um, Nivea Aqua Sensation Invigorating Day Cream. It holds the um, capacitors down really well and whatever's left I can use on my face to hold my face together. <laughs> of course, it's just silica, you know that. I just dispense a little bit in here, just keeps the air off it for a little bit longer. Bent leads here. We do not like the bent leads. Yeah, well that one's just a bit, bit out. I just didn't want to cover those. For a couple of reasons. One, I like to be able to read them, be able to check them, and resistors create heat. Heat is the enemy of capacitors, and even though these are 105 degree um, caps, 105 degree centigrade caps, we still want to protect them from direct heat if possible, and putting them straight over the resistor, yeah, not ideal. All right, let's slowly bring this back to life. 
We're going to have a look now at the power tubes and I'll just quickly explain why I'm suspecting one of them or they may be not so well matched anymore. Um, we checked, so here's our output circuit here. Our uh, B plus from there is going to the center tap of the output transformer. So the only thing between the output transformer and the plate is that winding. So that should be identical, but it's not. What could be causing one tube to be drawing more than another tube? We checked the screens and the screen voltages were identical. We checked the uh, control grids and the control grids were identical. So really the only thing left is that one tube has just drifted significantly away from the other. I and mean, what's significant? Man, uh, in the golden days pre-Putin, I would have said, you know, anything more than 10, 15 percent is no longer a good match. But these days would probably accept 20 percent. 30 percent, we're going to have to say that they're no longer matched. 40% obviously, forget it. Well, it works, the amp works, but it's not ideal. So um, it may be hard to get a good bias on it. Not that Mesa Boogie make it easy to bias because he has this, Randall Smith has this maniacal idea that um, we amp techs um, have it, it, you know, made up this requirement that amps should be biased, which is ridiculous. They do have to be biased at a safe level. You don't want to bias them too hot, they'll burn out, they'll red plate. You don't want to bias them too cold because you're going to get this nasty crossover distortion. So how does Randall do it? He does it by, I haven't measured this one, but I would be guessing that he has biased them very cold so that um, he can get away with saying tubes don't need to be biased, amps don't need to be biased as long as you buy tubes off him which is obviously a load of garbage. All right I'm now going to make a quick call to the owner and just confirm that he wants to replace those tubes. The tubes have been removed. I just want to measure the voltages around there with no influence of the tubes. So you can't see the meter, but we've got 466.2 on that tube. This is the plates. 465.7. That's very close. Let's try our screens. 464.8 here's our control grid minus 56.8 minus 56.8 okay 463.6 463.7. All right, I think the differences have to be the tube because everything else is just seeming too close. All right, the owner has given me a pair of tubes which are significantly better matched, the second hand. Uh, but significantly better match than what's come out of them. So I just want to see what happens here. There's a bit of jitteriness. Have you seen this? Oh, yeah, okay. That's just not looking happy to me. All right, maybe this is why they're second hand. I've got a brand new set of tubes in there 
and we can see these voltages are just jumping around like crazy. Why is it so? Let's just check out what's happening with the voltages. See if that gives us a clue. I will measure, um, take those tubes out and just check these screen grid resistors and make sure they're still okay. There's something going on here because we can't get a stable uh, plate current reading. So something weird is happening. I've tried two new tubes. So I'm confident it's not the tube. I've checked the screen voltages. They're pretty close to each other. Not exactly the same, but pretty close. Differences would be any differences in those 470 amp resistors. I checked them. They're pretty close. So what else could it be? Um, we're going to now look at what's coming in and controlling this tube. So we've got here the bias voltage is coming in here, going through this 220K resistors. So these need to be matched. But it's that jumping around thing that makes me think it's not that. I'm now suspicious about this coupling capacitor. So I've, what I've done is I've lifted the leg on that coupling cap on that um, on the tube side. So we're going to have a look at one side of each coupling cap. We should be seeing a pretty high voltage around about 230 volts. Let's see if that is the case. You can't read my meter, so take my word for it. So here's those two capacitors. You can see I've lifted them up a bit. And on here, we have 260 volts. This is on the phase inverter side. And that one is 256 volts on the phase inverter side. On the control grid of one tube, we've got minus 59.1 on the control grid of the other tube we've got minus 59.1 so very good chance that these two resistors here are perfectly matched as are these 220Ks so we're suspecting the uh, coupling caps is leaking so I'll try and measure them with my um, digital voltmeter which has got a very high input impedance and I don't know that we can fully trust its value so because of that high input impedance I made myself a little um, leakage tester and one day I promise I'm going to um, do a video on this little leakage tester so you, if you haven't seen the previous video, I think it was the Marshall 2104. I'll put a link to it up above us pretty much now. And uh, when I did this leakage test on there, they showed no leakage. Let's see how we go now. So if we have a leakage, we'll have a green illumination. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see that but that's definitely illuminating green. So I'm going to say that capacitor there is leaking. Let's try the other one. It is also green. I'm thinking that one is leaking as well. There seems to be no sign of fading of that LED brightness. So I'm pretty confident that those two uh, coupling caps from the phase inverter to the power tubes are both leaking. Obviously, we've got to do some pretty serious discharging. Well, I hope you liked part one. If you liked part one, please give it a like. Any comments you put down there, uh, I will answer every single comment, I think. And... Um,
uh, if you haven't already subscribed, it would do me a great uh, honor if you could subscribe to the channel as well. So coming up in part two, very exciting. Um, and this is really important if you've got an amp from the 50s, 60s, 70s, it is really important that you check the power wiring. That's the mains wiring coming into the amplifier, how it's handled, how it's wired, nearly always wrong by today's standards. So please have a look at that and check your amp out. Um, Many amps, certainly vintage amps, certainly in the US, where voltages have gone up from 110 to 120, that's 10%, um, are going to have increased filament, heater voltages. The design value is 6.3 volts AC. Um, they can happily go up to 6.9, but over that, you're going to start reducing the life of your tube. So, the previous tech on this, there was a couple of previous techs. Um, Ronald McDonald was one of them. And um, another guy who was really quite good did some work on here as well. So I can see two categories of techs. And he came up with a way of reducing the filament voltage. Worked very effectively so you can reproduce what was done here. Another thing which Mesa Boogie claim, which I don't know if they still claim it, hopefully not, uh, is that um, us wealthy <laughs> amp techs uh, make money is by saying that you need to buy us an amp. So um, Mesa Boogie have come up with a way of allegedly not requiring uh, you to buy us the amp. There's a price to pay for that and we'll look at it and this amp was typical of how its tone suffered. I corrected it a little bit. Um, oh yeah, there's another common cutting out issue with Mesa Boogies and Many amps that use send returns, uh, send return jacks, and we'll look at how to uh, correct that issue before it becomes a problem or if it has already become a problem. So I'm looking forward to seeing you on part two.